Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes general questions. It's time to move on to the next item of business, which is First Minister's question. And I call question number one, Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I understand the corporate body uh, have announced that an investigation is going to be launched into the Health Secretary's expense claims. And while that investigation is welcome, the Health Secretary still needs to come forward to this Parliament to give full answers, and the First Minister must give us frank responses today. So, for a moment, let's set aside the doubts about Michael Matheson's latest story on how he racked up a massive bill on his phone while on holiday. If we believe the unbelievable, if we suspend our disbelief, if we assume this fable is true just for one minute, it still doesn't explain why, back in February, Michael Matheson claimed £11,000 of taxpayers' money for a bill he couldn't account for. He promised Parliament. He gave written assurances this bill was the result of constituency work and only constituency work. His new version of events proves, beyond doubt, that that claim was false. The First Minister said this was a legitimate expense. Does he still believe that? First Minister. Well, let's remember, of course, the fact that when Michael Matheson discovered, after speaking again to his family, to his teenage boys, after it was told to him uh, the, the use uh, of the iPad, which Michael Matheson, of course, laid out in full in a personal statement last week, Michael took the immediate decision to pay back the full amount. Michael Matheson has made... Michael Matheson has made mistakes uh, in the handling of this issue. That is something that he has admitted to. And what I thought was a very emotional statement to this chamber. He gave the reasons why. Because he wanted to protect his teenage boys from, frankly, the harsh political and public scrutiny that often comes with the roles that we occupy. But on discovering from his teenage boys what happened, he agreed to immediately pay back the full amount. Let me read a quote from an STV interview. I'm sorry, it was a big mistake. It's something that shouldn't have happened. But I am ultimately the only person responsible for that. This was a big mistake by me, for which I'm deeply sorry. I know how badly I've performed here and how much I've let people down. And for that, and for that I'm very sorry. Forgive me, this was a quote from Douglas Ross when he failed to declare £28,000 of income, presiding officer. Now, the point here is that we didn't, we didn't call for Douglas Ross to quit. We accepted, of course, the point that he had made an honest mistake. And the hypocrisy here, presiding officer, that people will see through is that Douglas Ross says it's fine for him to make an honest mistake, but not fine for Michael Matheson to make an honest mistake. So we will not get distracted by Douglas Ross's political opportunism. The health secretary is getting on with the job of ensuring that a health service recovers through what will be a difficult winter, presiding officer. I'm going to require briefer questions and responses. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let's be very clear. My apology, which was full and frank, was about not declaring something. Michael Matheson tried to dupe the taxpayer out of £11,000. £11,000 he wanted the taxpayer to pay. And isn't that the reason why the First Minister couldn't answer my question? And since he didn't, let's put it there again. The First Minister previously said it was a legitimate expense claim. Does he still believe that? Because Michael Matheson did claim that £11,000 from the taxpayer and promised Parliament it was for constituency work. But his story has changed. Now we're supposed to believe that he didn't understand why he had been billed so much, that he was clueless. Michael Matheson supposedly didn't know anything about it, but he was certain it was the taxpayer's problem and their bill to pay. So, First Minister, if he had no idea what the bill was for, why on earth did he claim taxpayers to pay it? First Minister. First, the motivations for Michael's actions last week, before his uh, personal statement, I'm not sure why First I'm Minister, told Mr. First Minister, can I ask you to your seat? Mr Ross, Mr Swinney, I would expect better behaviour from both of you 
We need to hear the answers from the First Minister. We need to hear the questions as well. First Minister, please resume. Well, they clearly don't want to hear the answers. That is the exact point. You can, you can hear. They really don't want to hear the answers, presiding officer. Again, Michael Matheson, in what I would say it was a very emotional personal statement to this chamber, laid out in full detail the handling uh, of the issue in relation to the expenses in relation to his iPad. And he was clear that he should have handled it better. I agree with that. Uh, he, of course, on discovery of the fact that his iPad uh, had been used uh, by his teenage boys, agreed immediately to pay back the full amount. Now, look, as a father of two children, including uh, a, a teenager myself, uh, I can understand the motivation to protect your family, but I agree with others in this chamber that it should not have been handled in this way, and Michael Matheson, of course, admitted to that. Now, what Michael Matheson, after making that personal statement, has been getting on with is the job of Health Secretary. That's why on Monday he chaired Forth Valley's annual review. That's why this week he's announced £42 million for an extra 153 doctor training places, the largest expansion on record. It's why he visited Glasgow Caledonian University's uh, School for Life and Health Sciences. Uh, Sciences. It's why he met this week the Royal College of Nursing. Because as much as Douglas Ross, as much as the Conservatives want to distract him, what I've got is a health secretary that's getting on with the job. I am going to have to require briefer questions and responses. Douglas Ross. We've got a health secretary who claimed £11,000 from the taxpayer and a first minister who won't simply answer, was that a legitimate claim to make or not? Michael Matheson is taking the public for fools. He supposedly found out on Thursday, two weeks ago, what really happened. He apparently learned at that stage that there was personal use of the iPad and other people had incurred the data costs. But the following Monday, Michael Matheson was asked point blank if there was any personal use of the iPad. He said no. He was asked directly if anyone else had used it. He said no. First Minister, was the Health Secretary telling the truth when he gave those answers? First Minister. Again, I will say for the third time, Michael Matheson accepts and admits and admitted to this chamber that he made mistakes in the handling. And Douglas Ross is shouting to me, why? Michael Matheson once again addressed that because he did what he did to protect his teenage boys. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely. Has he admitted that? Absolutely. Has he agreed to pay back the full amount? Absolutely. And isn't it telling, uh, presiding officer, that Douglas Ross wants to talk about the health secretary. What he doesn't want to talk about is the savage cuts yeah. the UK government yeah. have unleashed on the health service yeah. through yesterday's autumn statement. Let me read. If you, want to, if you want to listen to those in the health service, presiding officer, let's hear from the RCN's chief nurse, Professor Nicola Ranger. She said the autumn statement is short-sighted, that the NHS faces a multi-billion pound deficit. They don't want to hear from nurses, presiding officer. They want to try to distract. They want to try to deflect. They want to try to dodge away from the fact that their autumn statement has led to savage cuts to the health service. Well, we won't let them Douglas forget, Ross. presiding officer. Douglas. The only person deflecting here is Hamza Youssef, who cannot give honest answers. And if everything to do with Michael Matheson was an honest mistake, why have there been so many dishonest statements about it? And while Michael Matheson's story has unravelled, Hamza Youssef himself has been caught up in it. He was told by Michael Matheson last Tuesday what actually happened and the personal use. But the following day, last Wednesday, Hamza Youssef told the press and the public, and I quote, for me, the matter is now closed. He continued that Michael Matheson had, and this is a quote from the First Minister, taken the decision given the honest mistake that has been made in relation to the updating of the SIM card. And he stuck to the same story that he knew was false. And this morning, the Deputy First Minister was further embroiled into this scandal. She was asked if, on a point of principle, ministers in the Scottish Government always tell the Parliament and the public 
the truth? She refused to answer that question. So let me ask Hamza Youssef, if government ministers need to be honest, why is Michael Matheson still in a job? First Minister. I will say for the fourth time that Michael Matheson admits to making mistakes in the handling of this issue. And it is astonishing that Douglas Ross thinks that the party of Boris Johnson, a man that Douglas Ross described as honest, can lecture anybody about standards in public life, presiding officer. Isn't it really telling here that we have a corporate body that has said today, just before First Minister's questions, and I will quote directly from them, that in the interest of fairness to all and to avoid prejudicing its investigation, the SPCB will, as of now, not comment on any matters that could be a bearing on this process or provide a running commentary. I think it's right that we let the SPCB get on with the job that it's got to do, and Michael Matheson will get on with the job of ensuring he supports the health service through what will be a difficult winter presiding officer. Question to Anna Sawa. <clears throat> Deputy presiding officer, honesty and integrity from members of both our governments is essential for faith in public life to be restored. This morning on the BBC, the Deputy First Minister was asked twice, do ministers in the Scottish Government always tell Parliament and the public the truth? The answer should have been an unequivocal and simple yes. But instead, the Deputy First Minister's answer was that they only aim to do so. People have known for a long time that this Government has a problem with the truth. But is this now the official Government position? First Minister. Look, uh, we should all be telling the truth in our interactions, wherever they are and wherever they occur. I will say once again what I said four times to Douglas Ross already, that Michael Matheson, of course, admits to mistakes. He admits to mistakes in relation to the handling uh, of this entire episode. But when Michael Matheson found out uh, late on Thursday night, not last week, the week uh, before, uh, that uh, his family had used uh, the iPad, he took the immediate decision the next day to pay back the full amount. In a personal statement to this parliament, he admitted uh, not just the mistakes he made, uh, but he admitted the reasons uh, for uh, those mistakes. He has undoubtedly reflected on that, and now what he has done this week is get on with the job as health secretary and ensure that he's supporting our NHS through what will be an incredibly difficult winter indeed. Anna Sawa. Deputy Prime Minister, I'm, I'm so pleased the First Minister said that we should always be telling the truth. Because in the short time Hamza Youssef has been First Minister, the record of this Parliament has had to be corrected three times because of wrong information he has told this chamber. Once was in response to the serious issue of, COVID, of the COVID inquiry and deleted WhatsApp messages. And another was in response to me in this chamber when the First Minister gave an inaccurate answer about Scotland's renewables. But instead of immediately correcting the record, he took up hours of civil service time to try and spare his blushes. We know this because Labour now has the full unredacted emails between the First Minister's office and officials. They show that when civil servants pointed out he was wrong, he rejected their advice. Instead, his advisers had civil servants spend a month trying to cover up with a new line, including manufacturing statistics, to fit his answers. First Minister, if these are the lengths you will go to to hide the truth on a simple mistake, should anyone be surprised that you won't sack Michael Matheson for knowingly misleading the public? First Minister. There is a reason, presiding officer, why the people of Scotland time and time and time again have elected us to be the government of Scotland. And there's a reason why Anna Sarwar and the, and the Conservative Party sit here First in opposition. Minister. First Minister, and Anna Sarwar is could you resume your seat? There is far too much barracking and background noise as the First Minister is responding to the questions. Let's hear the First Minister. First Minister. Uh, and Anna Sarwar is shouting, they haven't elected me. Can I remind him, I have won elections to this parliament. In fact, the seat that I represent was held by a Labour MSP until I won it, presiding officer. So I won't take any lectures from Anna Sarwar about how you win an election, uh, if that's OK. In terms of the issue uh, that Anna Sarwar points to, when it comes to Scotland's energy potential, yes, of course, there is an encompassing upon any of us, whether it's a government minister or whether it's a backbencher, to correct the record if any inaccurate statement has been made. 
I take that responsibility very seriously. And what I won't apologise for, though, is the fact that we have an incredible renewables potential here in Scotland, a potential that we will invest in and we will unleash that full potential for the workforce going forward. So while we will talk up our energy potential, I know Anna Sauer is only interested in talking it down. Presenting it. Anna Sauer. Deputy Officer, the people of Scotland have only had one opportunity to pass judgment on Hamza Yusuf as First Minister. That was the Rutherglen and Hamilton West by-election when there was a 20% swing to Labour and Labour getting double the vote the SNP got. So I'll give you lessons on how to win an election, First Minister, come the next general election, because this is a gross breach of the relationship between ministers and officials. A gross breach. But not for the, not the First Minister and the government. This behaviour has become a norm for them. But actually, it's also a gross breach between ministers and the public when a minister can knowingly mislead them. And that's why Scottish Labour has long called for a clean-up Holyrood Act to sweep away the culture of secrecy and cover-up that the SNP have allowed to thrive. The Salmon Inquiry, the Ferry Scandal, the failures at the Queen Elizabeth in Glasgow and the sick kids in Edinburgh, deleted COVID WhatsApp messages, and now the Deputy First Minister now saying they only aim to tell the truth. Under the SNP, trust and faith in Scotland's institutions has been lost. Isn't it the case, as represented by the good people of Rutherglen Hamilton West, that this is a government that is running out of road, desperate to save their jobs, and willing to say anything to cling on to power? First Minister. Well, sir, it's clearly not the case because we've been re-elected time and time and time and time again by the people of Scotland to run our public services here in Scotland. In terms of uh, Freedom of Information uh, uh, Act, I'm more than happy to provide a written response, Anna Sauer, about the improvements that we have made in relation to responding back because we take our obligations very, very seriously. And Anna Sauer talks about trust. He talks about values. Well, I'm sorry, I do not know what the values are of Sir Keir Starmer uh, when, it comes to, uh, the, when it comes to UK Labour Party. Well, actually, I take that back. I do know what the values of Sir Keir Starmer are. The values of Sir Keir Starmer are to make sure that he retains the two-child limit, to make sure he retains the bedroom tax, to make sure he retains the rape clause, something, of course, Anna Sawar disagreed with and now suddenly agrees with. So we know what our values are, and nobody from London, nobody from party headquarters will tell us otherwise. Question three, Edward Mountain. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I remind members of my register of interest that I own a house and I am a private landlord. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government's policy to require households to replace their fossil fuel boilers with heat pumps or other green energy systems in off-gas properties by 2025 and in on-gas areas from 2030 is still going ahead. First Minister. Our 2021 heat and building strategy committed to introducing legislation to phase out the need to install new or replacement fossil fuel boilers. We will consult, consult very shortly on detailed proposals for a heat and buildings bill to ask everyone across Scotland to help us design and deliver this in the best way possible. That consultation will provide more detail on when and how the proposed changes will take effect. Uh, moving to clean heating systems will tackle Climate change reduced the exposure of homes and businesses to volatile fossil fuel prices. But our 2021 strategy also set out the need for the UK government to take urgent action. That includes rebalancing gas and electricity prices and making sure that energy companies themselves are playing their part in delivering this vital transition. Let me be clear, presiding officer, we simply cannot meet our legal targets in tackling climate change if we do not end our use of gas boilers. Edward Mayton. And I thank the First Minister for that attempted answer. I'm not sure I'm any clearer whether those targets will be met. It appears we'll have to wait. But First Minister, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's absolutely vital that we do reach net zero. And in order to do so, we need to take the public with, with us. Does the First Minister therefore acknowledge, like some of his SNP MP, MSPs do, that the unrealistic and poorly thought out policies set by his Green Party colleagues in government, such as this one and the DRS scheme, are causing more damage in reaching net zero than they are in achieving it. Yeah. First Minister. 
Planning Officer, we get to the crux of the Conservatives' uh, issue and problem here is that on the, in the face, in the very face of a climate crisis that in the summer engulfed many parts of our planet in flames, it has flooded many other parts of our planet in the recent weeks and months at home and abroad. We have a Conservative Party that tell us they're not climate sceptics, they're not climate change deniers, but oppose every single measure that this government brings forward to tackle yeah. climate change. Every so every time we bring forward a sensible proposal that's necessary to meet our targets, and we all voted for those targets, they're opposed by the Conservatives. Um, the Conservatives have to decide what side they are on. Are they on the side trying to protect and save this planet, or are they on the side of climate deniers and climate sceptics? They have chosen to make climate change, shamefully, a culture war election issues. Yeah. Tories aren't just bad for Scotland, not just bad for the UK, but it seems they're bad for our planet too. Presenting. Supplementary, Fergus Ewing. Presenting officer, we all agree that there is an acute housing shortage in this country, yet Homes for Scotland, Calla Homes, Taylor Woodrow and Persimmon, all major house builders, have all warned, all warned repeatedly that the heat pump targets, especially for new builds, have had the effect of forcing up costs of house building so that fewer homes are being built in Scotland. So, if the First Minister wants to tackle the housing shortage, will he consign the Green Party half-baked pie-in-the-sky policy in the bin where it belongs, alongside deposit return and highly protected marine areas, and will he recycle his Green Ministers to the back benches where they belong and then meet with industry and real experts, actual experts, first minister, to work out first a plan minister. to solve we'll have a problem. response to the First Minister. Well, perhaps the applause from the Conservative benches might demonstrate to Fergus Shewing that his, uh, his proposals are not the most sensible uh, that he is suggesting that we bring forward. Uh, I do not believe, I do not believe that we can simply put our head in the sand and ignore the scale of the climate crisis that we are facing. Yes, house building and house construction is facing challenge. Just look at sky-high rocketing inflation caused by the Conservative government. So yes, let's tackle skyrocketing inflation. Let's tackle some of those high construction costs. And of course, we have uh, several, not just targets, but significant investment in, the, in, in, in house building uh, over the course of this parliament and uh, beyond. And when it comes to ensuring that we replace gas boilers, presiding officer, we will not consign that policy at all to the dustbin of history. In fact, history will judge very poorly those who are climate sceptics or indeed climate deniers in the face of a climate crisis that is harming our planet. Mark Roscoe. While UK government sinks into another culture war cheered on by climate change deniers and naysayers, here in Scotland we're realising our ambitions on heat transition. From next April, all new buildings will need to meet our new standards for clean heating and our package of funding support for households is the most generous in the entire of the UK. So does the First Minister agree with me that our upcoming budget must drive forward pioneering work in tackling fuel poverty and empower households and businesses to make the move to clean heating? First Minister. Yes, I do agree that, uh, of course, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, transitioning from direct emissions heating systems to zero emissions uh, heating systems, that, of course, government has a significant role to play through legislation through its budget. But let's be equally clear that, of course, this is going to require private investment too. There's barely going to be a government in the world that's going to be able to self-finance that transition to net zero entirely on its own. And that's why the good work being done by the Green uh, Heat Task Force uh, is work uh, that uh, I am looking forward uh, to seeing. Uh, well, we've seen the report and I'm looking forward uh, to acting upon. So uh, Mark Rusko is absolutely right. We've got to make sure we do take the public uh, with us. That's why we do have such generous uh, grants uh, available, the most generous uh, in uh, the UK in terms of funding support for uh, households. But I go back to the very point that I've made 
uh, to everybody who's asked on this question that none of us, none of us, can deny in the face of an existential threat the scale of the climate crisis, none of us can deny that action is needed and, uh, and to accelerate that action as quickly as we possibly can. And Finlay Carson. Uh, on the 14th of September, the First Minister told this chamber that the climate change plan would be published before Christmas. Now, despite the, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero's uh, assertions that it was down to the UK Government, Chris Stark, the Chief Exec of the Climate Change Committee, said that there was only uh, minor uh, impacts on the Scottish plan and potentially positive impacts from the UK-wide strategy to accelerate grid infrastructure, but there were reasons to go faster. So when will the climate change plan be published? First Minister. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, we will publish uh, the plan. We'll publish the plan before the statutory target. Now, we aimed, of course, to do it a year before the statutory target of when uh, to, to publish that plan. Uh, and I think uh, what I would say to Finlay Carson is that the UK government's uh, rollback on its climate ambitions, many of its U-turns, uh, are not just, uh, of course, bad for those living in the rest of the UK. They clearly will have an impact on Scotland, and it's right it's right that we look to explore in detail what those impacts are. And I think it's frankly shameful that in an issue of this existential uh, 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 crisis, that that has been turned into an election issue, a cultural war issue, by the Conservatives. Wouldn't it be far better that we had an element of consensus on the fact that all of us have to pick up the pace, urgently accelerate the work of, of tackling the climate crisis, and if we don't, our current generations and our future generations simply won't forgive us, Presiding Officer. Question for Alistair Allen. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to households that are experiencing the pressure of increased energy bills in light of Citizen Advice Scotland launching its Worried This Winter Awareness campaign. First Minister. Well, energy bills remain significantly higher than two years ago due to a volatile energy market and the UK Government's complete and utter failure to act. So campaigns like Citizen Advice Scotland worried this winter together with our current Home Energy Scotland campaign which will drive vital referrals to HES Warmer Homes programme, they are extremely important indeed. I have consistently called on the UK Government to fully utilise the fiscal and policy levers at their disposal to introduce measures like a social tariff as a means to target support to those who need it the most, which unfortunately they failed to do in the Chancellor's autumn statement, uh, leaving those in businesses and communities already facing fuel poverty to suffer even more so. Alistair Allen. Uh, I thank the First Minister who will be aware that energy costs uh, are a particular worry in our island communities who experience disproportionately high levels of fuel poverty. In yesterday's autumn statement, the Chancellor rejected SNP calls for a £400 energy rebate, but with energy prices set to rise again by 5%, can the First Minister assure my constituents uh, that the Scottish Government will continue to support people struggling with their energy bills while the UK Government so evidently ignores them? First Minister. I can uh, reassure them on that point. With energy bills rising again in January, it is unacceptable that the UK Government's autumn statement completely failed to deliver support for those that need it the most. This government has provided an additional £1 million this year through the Islands Cost Crisis Emergency Fund to support islanders facing high fuel, food and energy costs in order to help meet cost, the cost of living pressures. So while we continue to help people make their homes warmer and easier to heat through our heat and energy efficiency support schemes and support those in fuel crisis through a fuel and security fund, the powers to make a real difference do, unfortunately, remain uh, with the UK government. And it's frankly only when we have these powers in, this, in control of the Scottish Parliament and indeed the Scottish government through independence that we can unleash the full potential of our energy rich nation. Presenting officer. Supplementary, Sarah Boy. Given the impact of fuel poverty in the 38% of households who ex experience fuel poverty and the 30% with extreme fuel poverty, what lessons has this First Minister learned from the failure to deliver £133 million of investment to make people's homes energy efficient and mean that they can afford to heat their homes? What will happen for next year? How many homes are going to get that energy retrofitting in place? First Minister. Well, President Officer, we have taken action to help with fuel uh, poverty. One of the first acts that I did as uh, First Minister was to ensure that we didn't just double uh, the fuel insecurity fund, but we tripled the fuel insecurity fund. We relaunched the Warmer Home Scotland scheme from 2nd of October with more funding and help for households 
to receive a climate-friendly heating system. In the year 2022-23, we delivered measures in almost 5,500 households, a record number of installs through warmer homes in Scotland. As I said, we've already agreed to triple the fuel and security fund. We also have, of course, the child winter heating payment. I'm more than happy to ensure that the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, writes to Sarah Boyack with full details uh, of how we're supporting those who are facing fuel poverty uh, this winter. But again, instead of having to mitigate the failures of a Westminster government, how much better would it be if we had the powers in our own hands, Presiding Officer? Question 5, Sue Webber. To ask the First Minister what work has been done to support the expanding role of the GP surgery. First Minister. Since 2018, we have significantly expanded the range of healthcare professionals supporting GP practices. Across Scotland, there's now over 4,730 primary care multidisciplinary team members working in areas such as pharmacy, physiotherapy, uh, phlebotomy, uh, and other disciplines too. This means the average practice now has access to more than five uh, MDT members alongside GPs and their practice teams. Uh, through our £190 million uh, PCIF Primary Care Improvement Fund, we're enabling those vital teams to free up practice time to so that GPs can focus on more complex community care and reduce referrals into secondary care, ensuring more people get the right care in the right place at the right time. Sue Webber. I thank the First Minister for that response. Indeed, the expanding role of GP surgeries is critical to help prevent acute hospitals and A&E departments from being overwhelmed. However, they cannot recruit and retain the various MDT members that the First Minister has made reference to. Collinson Surgery in my region has contacted me to express their concern in the disparity in pay which is developing between GP surgery staff and NHS staff. There is now a two-tier NHS pay scale. Staff there are frustrated and demoralised. GP staff were uplifted less than their Agenda for Change NHS colleagues. Will the First Minister find the investment to ensure an uplift can be agreed to ex support the expanding GP practices that continue to struggle? First Minister. Well, it's incredible we're being asked to provide more funding yeah. for fairer pay at a time when the UK Government next year will give us a paltry just under £11 million yeah. in health consequentials. Yeah. Uh, that represents 0.06 per cent of our health budget uh, here in Scotland. And of course, when it comes to the health consequentials that they are giving this year, remarkably, they're not recurring for next year. So what we will do and what we will concentrate on is making sure that we, our, our NHS staff, are the best paid anywhere in the UK. In terms of those who work in GP practices, Sue Webber will be well aware, of course, about the independent recommendations of the DDRB. So we will continue to work with our GP practices uh, uh, right across the country to ensure we do everything we can to not only recruit, which we have done, but also retain uh, GP practice staff. But what I would say to Sue Webber is this government has an excellent track record when it comes to fair pay in our NHS. Very stark contrast to the UK government presenting officer. And Paul Sweeney. Thank you, President Officer. GPs in Glasgow tell me they are firefighting but still being expected to do more with less. The mental health and wellbeing strategy is making more demands on GPs but with little detail on additional capacity or resource. So does the First Minister acknowledge the pressure that GP practices are under and does he agree with them that the mental health strategy is simply not deliverable without further support? First Minister. Of course we seek to support and invest in mental health services uh, and we have a good again track record uh, of doing so over the years. I'm more than happy uh, to ensure that the Finance Secretary engages uh, with the Labour Party, with any uh, political party, in relation to what more we can do uh, in the upcoming uh, budget. Mental health has been, always will be, an essential part of general practice, with mental health issues a common feature of consultations. And the mental health and wellbeing strategy, which was refer referenced by Paul Sweeney, acknowledges the need to increase mental health capacity within general practice. So I would say uh, to Paul Sweeney, we have a good record track record of investment in health service, of course, uh, this financial year, taking it to uh, 19 uh, billion. So we are more than willing uh, to work with those right across the chamber to see what further we can do. Uh, but I would say to Paul Sweeney, uh, of course, in the face of significant financial constraints, those who are suggesting that we spend more money in particular areas will have to say where that money comes from. Question six, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the autumn statement. First Minister. Well, the first time, of course, the autumn statement has been raised, and I'm not surprised that the Conservative members didn't want to go near it because they're just as embarrassed 
as they absolutely should be on such a dismal uh, autumn statement. It's deeply disappointing that the Chancellor has failed to provide the funding that devolved governments need in the autumn statement. This makes the challenge of our budget next year even more severe. And yet again, the Conservatives have completely failed to take action to support struggling households, businesses, public services, missing the opportunity to invest in the services that people rely on and infrastructure that's so vital to our economy. The increase to the minimum wage falls short of the real living wage. And despite the cut to national insurance, hardworking people are still seeing their living standards fall. We are once again at the mercy of poor UK government decisions, which compound the pressure on our public finances and increase uh, the misery uh, that is faced by struggling households. Wouldn't it be far better, presiding officer, that we didn't have to mitigate, that we didn't have to wait for autumn statements from the UK government, an unelected UK government, but instead that we had the powers in our own hands? President Kenneth officer. Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The First Minister will be aware that the £25 billion in election bribes that uh, the autumn statement contains is less than half the £55 billion in tax increases and spending cuts the Tories imposed after the disastrous trust mini-budget last year. Does he share my astonishment that at a time of high inflation, the shockingly low extra £11 million for Scotland's NHS is barely a two-thousandth of its annual budget, that capital budgets will be severely cut next year, impacting on essential infrastructure, and that Scotland's public services will inevitably pay the price of yet another abysmal Tory budget? First Minister. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with Kenny Gibson. Uh, yesterday's autumn statement, statement provided the very worst-case scenario uh, to Scotland's finances at a time when we need investment in infrastructure to help grow the economy and in public services that so many people rely on. Instead, we ended up with a cut in national insurance that will deprive those vital services of the much-needed funds that they require. And as a result of the UK government's disastrous handling of the economy, projected growth is just 0.7 per cent next year. Inflation is still running at more than twice the government's target. We needed an autumn statement that grew the economy, invested in public services, protected the most vulnerable in our, soci in our society. Instead, we had proposed sanctions that will penalise those very people. As we develop Scotland's budget next month, we'll do so, of course, in line with our missions of equality, community and opportunity. And just a reminder, presiding officer, of course, the last time the UK government, uh, when they did their uh, disastrous mini-budget, it was the Conservatives who demanded that we copy them, that we follow, uh, follow suit. Thank goodness, presiding officer, that we ignored them. Supplementary no wonder the people of Scotland ignored them. Smith. What the autumn statement did, of course, First Minister, was to tell small businesses in England and Wales that they will benefit for another year for a 75% discount on business rates. So can I ask again if the Scottish Government will ensure that that is also the case for small businesses in Scotland? First Minister. Well, uh, can I say, uh, President Officer, of course, we have a very good track record of when it comes to supporting our businesses. Small business uh, bonus scheme, uh, of course, and of course we have... Uh, we have a very generous uh, business support uh, package. So we will consider, uh, of course, the consequentials that come our way. We will consider what more uh, we can do to support businesses, uh, presiding officer. But what I would say uh, to Liz Smith is that for the small relief that they are giving to businesses, it will be minuscule in terms, in comparison to the damage that her party has inflicted upon business through Brexit. The disaster of Brexit being felt by businesses uh, up and down this country will not be undone by the paltry sums given by the Chancellor yesterday. We move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call first Cocab Stewart. Thank you. Um, it's welcome that Israel and Hamas have reached an agreement to exchange 50 of the hostages held in Gaza for a four-day pause in fighting. But much more work is needed to secure a ceasefire and prevent a further loss of innocent life. Could the First Minister advise what the Scottish Government's response is to this development, given that the Parliament has now expressed its view on a ceasefire? First Minister. Well, can I commend members right across the chamber for what I thought was a very good debate uh, in relation to the ceasefire. And I was pleased that the Parliament uh, backed by a majority a ceasefire uh, to be uh, called. Can I also say that uh, I know that uh, the four-day pause will be much welcome relief to those in Gaza who have suffered uh, complete and utter devastation over the last six and a half uh, weeks. Uh, can I thank in particular those who have been involved in, in, in helping to negotiate that 
uh, four-day uh, pause, the United States, uh, Egypt, and in particular Qatar, who have been at the centre of those negotiations. Uh, I think all of us will say uh, that we welcome uh, that four-day pause, but we want it not to be a four-day pause, but a permanent uh, ceasefire. So I would urge the UK government uh, to use whatever influence it has uh, alongside the international community to ensure that after four days, the bombing of innocent men, women and children doesn't just resume, but we actually have peace. Uh, and not only that, that, they all strive towards a long-term peace which must be predicated on a two-state solution. Tess White. First Minister, Old, Mel Old Meldrum Dental Practice and Laws Dental in Carnoustie have told patients they have no choice but to ditch NHS treatment because of increasing costs and the recent changes enacted by this SNP Green Government. Far from protecting dental treatment from for NHS patients, we're seeing an exodus of dentists from the NHS because of the government's actions. Will the First Minister commit to finding a better working structure for dentistry to ensure its long-term long sustainability? Yeah. First Minister. Well, we have invested in NHS dental services and, of course, recently just agreed um, some additional NHS dental reforms. And the purpose of those reforms, the exact point of those reforms, is to incentivise NHS dentistry. So that uh, has seen some increased fees for dentists, which I'm uh, happy to ensure that the Health Secretary writes to Tess White with the full details uh, of that. In, relation, in, in, in addition uh, to that, it's fair to say that NHS registration in Scotland is significantly higher than the rest of the UK, with more than 95 per cent of the population registered with an NHS dentist. That's not to take away from the important points that Tess White does raise. We do know on the back of the pandemic there have been and continue to be challenges uh, for our dental sector right across uh, Scotland and right across the UK. And I'll ensure the Health Secretary writes in detail to Tess White about what we're doing to support NHS dentistry in Scotland. Mercedes Vialba. Constituents working in modern languages at the University of Aberdeen have contacted me about university management's plans to withdraw honours degrees in languages, cultures and societies. Given the Scottish Government's commitment to improving language learning in schools and the existing shortage of language teachers in the North East region, does the First Minister agree with me that Scotland cannot afford for Aberdeen to lose these languages degrees? First Minister. Uh, can I say that uh, I agree with uh, much of what uh, Mercedes Vialba uh, says, that of course learning an additional language uh, is a great skill for any person to have. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the, the news that uh, Mercedes Vialba uh, gives to this parliament is of uh, concern. It is ultimately, of course, a matter for the university. It's appropriate that they make uh, those uh, decisions. But I will ensure that the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education, or indeed the Minister uh, for Further and Higher Education, does engage with Mercedes Vialba and see what uh, support we are able to offer. Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Workers in Grangemouth, in my constituency of Falkirk East, are fearful of their future after the announcement from Petro Ineos this week to move from a refinery to an import facility. Although I have an urgent question later today, will the First Minister take this chance to confirm he will do all in his power to protect this vital industrial asset and workers' jobs? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, I will uh, give that absolute confirmation. Can I thank uh, Michelle Thompson for raising uh, this issue? And as she says, there is an urgent question, I believe, uh, later this afternoon. Uh, Neil Gray and I both met with uh, Petri Ineos uh, earlier this morning. Neil Gray then went on to meet with the trade unions as well. And I believe he's offered a, a, a briefing for all MSPs right across the chamber tomorrow. Uh, so we will absolutely engage with uh, the owners. Uh, of uh, Grangemouth. We will, of course, engage, as we have been doing, uh, with trade unions. We will engage with the UK Government and we will do everything we possibly can to secure a sustainable future uh, for Grangemouth Refinery. In my conversations with Petro Aeneas, it was very, very clear uh, that there are a whole range of factors uh, that have to be uh, addressed, uh, some of those domestic, but undoubtedly many of them uh, global too. But I can give an absolute assurance to Michelle Thompson that uh, we will work with everybody uh, to ensure that there is a sustainable future uh, for Grangemouth uh, moving forward. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, on Tuesday, Shona Robeson, the Finance Secretary, failed to guarantee to farmers that £28 million of ring fence funding will be returned to the Scottish agricultural budget. Furthermore, £45 million is being cut from that rural budget. First Minister, why are you abandoning rural communities and farmers? First Minister. Astonishing. From the party of Brexit, talking about abandoning our farmers. 
the party that has, that has inflicted the biggest self-harm, the most dangerous self-harm our society, our economy has ever seen, and for what? So I don't think Rachel Hamilton or the Conservatives have an ounce of credibility when it comes to standing up for our farmers. So yes, we'll continue to invest in our agricultural community. We'll continue to invest in our farmers. What we will do is ensure that they don't have to suffer any more pain that has been inflicted upon them by the Conservatives' hard Brexit, Presiding Officer. And Paul O'Kane. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Today is Carers' Rights Day, a day in which we should all express our appreciation for what unpaid carers do. Um, the State of Caring report was also published today, making heroin reading, in particular, 51 per cent of carers who are struggling financially haven't had a break. So can the First Minister tell us why his carer strategy last year was so thin on respite commitments? And does he agree with calls, including from this side of the chamber, for at least two weeks of respite to support carers who are in such need? First Minister. More than happy to look into uh, that suggestion being made by Paul O'Kane. I want to start where, exactly where he did, which is to thank uh, all of our carers uh, for the incredible work that they do. But every single carer I meet will rightly challenge the government to say that it isn't just warm words they need, they need to see uh, action. And that's why this government uh, has acted. And I'm more than happy uh, for the Cabinet Secretary to write to Paul O'Kane uh, in detail around the measures that we have taken and are going to be taking to support carers uh, right now and into the future as well. But in terms of his uh, suggestion in relation to respite, that's one we'll give consideration to. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business will be a member's business debate in the name of Martin Whitfield. A brief pause and to allow the benches to change. And I suspend the meeting.